Hello guys, I hope uh, you're doing well at home. I believe that all this coronavirus stuff, curfew, lockdown will be over and we're gonna get through this. I miss you and I'm looking forward to meet you at the class. Uh, my student knows me already, but if anyone else over there, my name is Nulombo Boyevan. Uh, I deliver a lecture on transnational law at law faculty of Baku State University. We had lectures with you at the class, uh, you know. Uh, we have uh, talked about uh, general issues of transnational cr criminal law, uh, the meaning, the major elements, and so on. Then we do devoted our time to case law. I was in, uh, it was a very interesting landmark law about uh, landmark law of the US Supreme Court on applicability of US law uh, to the detainees of Guantanamo Bay. We had a very good and um, hot discussion, I recall, on this matter. Um, there was something and I like it and I'm looking forward to repeat it again. Then I will move to terrorism and terrorist financing issue. I hope we're going to be able to go back uh, case law, particularly on the terrorism matter uh, at the class face-to-face uh, uh, -face manner uh, because there are lots of controversial, uh, controversial issue over there. But today we're going to talk about another interesting topic. Pretty trans transnational in its nature, it is money laundering. Uh, money laundering is one of the major transnational crime. Uh, lots of foreign uh, or transnational elements there is, either in its content or its impact. When we talk about money laundering, uh, money may make its way over border easily. Money does not recognize state borders. Uh, do you recall we talk about state borders uh, and the transnational uh, crime concept? You may send money to overseas in a jiffy like this. Therefore, uh, it creates both opportunities and threat and may easily be misused by criminals. The term money laundering was coined in the famous 1920s gangster era of American history. Between gambling, prostitution, and sales of prohibited alcohol, there was a lot of cash that required to be laundered. In other words, a method had to be developed so that the government did not become suspicious about the true nature of gangster funds. The major headache that gangsters faced was that the money they earn are in the form of cash currency and often in small denomination of metals or coins. If the funds were put into the bank, then question would be asked by the bank and ultimately the government. Was it storing large amounts of money in low value uh, coins uh, or amount or the cash uh, is a physical and a logistical, logistical nightmare? So the gangster created business, a lot of which involved slot machines. Another, uh, another was, was a laundromat. This init initial type of business gave them a means of giving a legitimate appearance to money derived from criminal activities. And so it's said the money laundering was born. Let's look at it. Maybe we could launder the money. 
That's a great idea. Okay, how do we do that? Way ahead of you. Uh, we declare just enough so as not to arouse suspicion, then Walt's one-time winnings become seed money for an investment. I deposit the cash into the account of a dummy finance company. Now, then I issue you a cashier's check in his name. Make it out to Ice Station Zebra Associates. That's my loan out. It's uh, totally legit. It's done just for tax purposes. You give it back to me as collateral on a loan that I make to you, but you don't pay back the loan. Money laundering, actually the practice of integrating the proceed of crime into the legitimate mainstream of financial community by concealing its origin. Another more, in other words, more simplistic terms, money laundering is making dirty money, appear to be legitimate. Appear to be legitimate. That's why it's called a money laundering as a cleaning. Money laundering may appear to many people like a sophisticated uh, international game of maestro, a chess match between good and bad. But make no mistake about it, there are some evil people behind the act of mal laundering. Quite often there is a fatal outcome to this uh, engaged in or surrounded by mal laundering. I think drug cartel, for example, and terrorist organizations that have a lot of money to London. So it's all about making money appear legitimate. That simple and wonderful definition. Oh, well, I can hear you now. So, so what big deal? I'm making it oh, like look look like a legitimate. Uh, and um, why should I care? Uh, you may say, why should I care, uh, teacher? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you may say, you may say, uh, I I feel intuitively, but uh, I plan to respond to all those questions. But but let's start with a basic question. Why does a bad guy have to launder his money in the first place? Let's check it out and go back then. My name is Jordan Belfort. The year I turned 26, I made $49 million, which really pissed me off because it was three shy of a million a week. Was all this legal? Absolutely not. We were making more money than we knew what to do with. We don't work for you, man. Yeah, my money take to your boobs. Technically, you do work for you. So follow me, you could about to go. I'm doing 500, I'm out of control. But there's nowhere to go. And there's no way to slow. The legitimate financial system is perhaps the safest place for the bad guy to keep his fortune. I believe it not. Uh, if bad guy A kept his loot under that mattress, then guaranteed bad guy B would rip him off. On them off the teeth, believe me, no such a thing. The bad guy needs to move the money around the globe quickly. That's exactly what the banks and money service business are set up to do, actually legitimately. The bad guy with his new fund fortune, that is a result of whatever crime has committed, finds himself in a position when he cannot go spending his money unnoticed. Doing so would bring suspicion upon him by neighbors, business, gatekeepers, financial institutions, and ultimately government agents. Those people would say, oh, 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 oh did this guy make so much money that affords him 
at his lifestyle. Once the government begins to dig under the rocks, they would find no means of income for Mr. Bad Guy. Then they would seriously examine his credential and his ability to have made all that money. For all of your money laundering pursuits out there, I can add one more element to the definition of money laundering that is usually left out. The well-known Palermo Convention, uh, you recall we talked about Palermo Convention in uh, sorry, 2000 in Palermo against transnational uh, organized crime defines that convention defines money laundering as the conversion or transfer of property knowing it's derived from criminal offense for the purpose of concealing or disguising its illicit origin or of assisting any person who is involved in commission of crime to evade the legal consequences of his actions. An important prerequisite in the definition of money laundering is knowledge. In order to be classified as money laundering, you should know or you should have known that money coming from criminal activity. Knowledge and intention is key in that concept, the whole concept. But it's very difficult to prove knowledge or intention of an offender. It's a mental state. You cannot predict the knowledge that inside somebody's brain. Therefore, a FATS standards requires that intended knowledge required to prove the offense of mal laundering includes the concept, includes the concept that such a mental state may be inferred from objective factual circumstances. What's objective factual circumstances? Like a time of crime and place of crime, a behavior of offender like this. So indirect evidence. So the, your whole case should be based on indirect evidence because there is no direct evidence that you may uh, you may collect. Okay. Uh, so far as it's so difficult to collect direct direct evidence uh, about mental state. Uh, like knowledge, because it's inside a offender's brain. You cannot, you cannot just predict what's in his brain. Whether there is knowledge about the origin of crime or not. Whether his intention was to loan the money or not. Therefore, a number of jurisdictions also use the legal principle of unlawful of willful blindness, willful blindness in my laundering cases to prove knowledge. Courts define willful blindness as the deliberate avoidance of knowledge of the facts or purposeful indifference and have held that willful blindness is the equivalent of actual knowledge of the illegal source of funds or the intentions of such customer in money laundering transaction. In other words, some players such as Smurf, Mules, Reshippers or some other low level of one of the bad guys may not actually consider it money launderers. For example, for example, let's bring a example. Some might be given uh, the job uh, to pick up suitcase and drop it somewhere else. They are just collecting a few dollars uh, for obeying instructions and driving a car from here to there without any idea what's in the vehicle or, or in the suitcase. Now, if the load is 
illegally obtain money, did they know? Can they therefore be charged with money laundering? Depending upon the circumstances and any outstanding evidence, probably not. Mules people whose job is to simply transport illegal goods with the money, guns, or drugs. Professional money launderers are smart to use mules, so they can limit the amount of information that any one person in their employ has in AML and in particular in fraud. We talk a lot about the separation of duties. This limits the damage when uh, law enforcement uh, um, crash their party. Well, in the, any self-respecting drug dealing operation, the money and the drug never meet. Nor do the mules have any clue what anyone else is doing. Well, let's look at coming up. Oh. Need help, sir? Oh, uh, officer, hi. You need uh, help? Uh, no, no, I'm fine, thank you. What do you got there? Uh, well, pecans. I'm delivering pecans to my niece. And pecans? Syrup. Yeah, pecans. She makes the worst pecan pie you've ever tasted. I feel sorry for her husband, but and I feel sorry for the pecans, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The mass don't see the laundering process like they do a fraud scheme. It's easy to hate frauders uh, who are ripping off the elderly with various scams. However, rarely do you hear the cry of string them off as a reference to your friendly neighborhood money launderer. Remember that for an event uh, to be considered money laundering, a predicate crime must have taken place. So there should be a some underlying criminal, criminal activity. To launder money, a previous crime must have taken place, such as gambling, drug dealing, or human trafficking. That crime is called the predicate crime. However, the various methods of, of money laundering make it virtually impossible to determine whether the suspect is a money launderer, tax evader, or terrorist financier. The reason is because many of the methods used to money around in stealthy fashion are similar or the same. Usually in the early stages of investigation, it's not known which, is, which one, if any, your suspect might be. More often that, Determination will come from law enforcement in the later stage of AML investigation, especially in the early stage. It's nearly early stage. It's nearly impossible to tell whether an illegal transfer of money is drug-related laundering, tax evasion, or uh, funding for terrorists. Okay. Now to get the question how money is laundered. Let's get into it. When a criminal comes into ill-gotten money through, let's say, political influence peddling or drug trafficking, they have to get creative to stay on the right side of the law. If they just pop it into a bank account, the feds are going to be knocking on their door by sunset. So they use a process called money laundering, cleansing dirty money of its criminal origins. Investopedia breaks down the two most common methods. You have simple and complex. First, the easy way. Let's say a drug dealer has $5,000, and let's say his friend or associate owns a pizza parlor. That restaurant can gradually mark up its earnings artificially by $5,000. 
then deposit that dirty money in the bank without ever attracting suspicion or at the very least have documentation to back up the earnings. Oftentimes, crime organizations own these front businesses, serving as pass-throughs for filthy dough. Now the second, more complex route, it's called smurfing. Since federal law requires any deposit over $10,000 be flagged by bank officials, criminals have to break that big chunk of bucks into bite-sized deposits. Like in the show Claws, where a pill mill is getting too much cash too quickly, they do frequent bank runs. Placing all that cash into one or maybe many different bank accounts in smaller sizes to avoid attention. As for that name, Smurfing, the University of Kentucky Law School explains, the army of persons who scurried from bank to bank to accomplish these transactions became known as Smurfs, because like their little blue cartoon namesakes, they were pandemic. Congress tried to stop the Smurfs in 1987, but it really hasn't worked well. The last step to all this, after criminals go to the simple or complex route, they have to decide, how do I get my money back? They can simply pull it out of the bank in the guise of a legitimate personal or professional transaction. If they're concerned about detection though, they can transfer the funds to yet another account, onshore or off, before withdrawing the money. Or if they're super sneaky, make a big purchase. Let's say buy an office building. Then they have a front business pay for that, giving them a paper trail, a giant profit, and a pocket full of freshly laundered cash. It was mentioned previously that money laundering is the process by which a large amount of illegal obtained money is given the appearance of having originated from a legitimate source. In other words, criminals can construct the appearance that you've gotten gain are actually theirs to spend. It allows the criminals maintain control over their illegal proceeds and ultimately to provide a legitimate cover, uh, cover story for their source of income. In other words, it allowed them to enjoy the fruits of their crimes. Money laundering usually involves a sequence of numerous transactions, use it as form of uh, as form of smoke screen to hit the true source of financial assets, uh, so that those financial gains may be used without exposing the criminals. Money laundering plays a fundamental role in facilitating the ambitious of the drug trafficker, the terrorist, the organized criminal, and the insider dealer, as well as the many others who need to await the kind of attention from the 40s that Southern Wells bring, brings from illegal action. By engaging in the type of activity, it's hoped to place the proceeds beyond the reach of any access for future law. For example, a subject claims to be a hot dog vendor in Buckley Boulevard. And each month he deposits 50,000 into his account at the bank. Either, in that case, either the subject has a lot of hot dog business coming to my mind, or there is something fishy about his hot dogs. This would be suspicious to the bank, to or to the FIUs, and to ultimately to the law enforcement. Some officials would want to know where the money actually came from, and investigation would bring begin. This is not what money launderer wants. He wants to conduct banking transactions that do not bring about suspicion. Why would this be suspicion to the bank? Actually, you may uh, ask question. The, ma the bank are obliged to perform due diligence on this customer as part of its customer identification program. The bank would perform a horizontal and vertical analyze of the account and other similar accounts when um, comparing activity to other hot dog vendors. The 
question should be, would the numbers seem right? Okay, is 50,000 per month the average of other hot dog vendors? Um, or not? Yeah, just has this vendor ever done that amount of business before? Could there be a legitimate reason? Those kind of questions should be asked uh, by the every bank anal anal analyst or FYO uh, analytics staff. Sure, perhaps this hot dog vendor has bought out nine other hot dog vendors and he's now hot dogging. Who knows? Hot dogging of Bucky Bulwer knows. However, there should be proof of that. If not, he would certainly be a person of interest. Tax evaders also launder money, perhaps for a bit of different reason. A tax evader usually makes money legitimately, but she does not want to, uh, to be taxed or the tax authority to discover her financial gains. So she can avoid paying taxes. Uh, get the concepts, uh, get the concepts of the stage. It's very essential. It's very the bedrock of every money laundering issue. The concepts uh, of stage are the foundation to understanding money laundering. Any test you may ever take about the subject or any certification that you might strive for, be it ACAMS, for example, uh, will almost and always ask question about the three stages of Malwondik. They are first placement, second layering, and third integration. Let's look at each one in turn. Let's start uh, with placement. Placement is the first stage of the process. Simply, this is the act of physically taking bulk cash proceeds and bringing them into the financial institution for deposit or transfer. That seems easy enough, right? Well, perhaps to the average person bringing cash to the bank is no big deal. But can you imagine some guy walking into the bank with a, a huge uh, just case, huge suitcase loaded with cash? It certainly would attract a lot of attention from the financial institution. This is where the money laundering needs, money launderer needs a good cover story, one that makes it seem all that cash appears to have come from a legitimate source. The dirty money needs to be transformed into less noticeable and more portable form and, and then placed into a legitimate financial institution. Since large amount of cash can attract attention and may be subject to reporting requirements, criminals depend upon the use of business that deal with substantial amounts of cash. Business that might normally have large amounts of small denomination bills include example, restaurants, bars, hotels, casinos, car wash, vending machines, uh, companies, vending machine companies, and um, laundromats. The large amounts of cash can be broken up into small amounts, then are then each deposited directly in the bank account. Okay, this is uh, this is how the uh, how the uh, the work uh, is going on. The end the end result is that the original money has been changed and is one step removed from its original starting point. The placement phase is the most vulnerable to uh, detection by law enforcement. Uh, it's sometimes uh, referred to as a choke point. 
As a result, law enforcement has concentrated on developing methods to make it harder to place ill-gotten gain without uh, detection. Methods such as suspicious activity report, currency transaction report, which is uh, our FYU financial intelligence uh, service uh, is dealing with, cross-border declaration uh, rules that uh, you may come across an airport. Uh, in all uh, this make it easier for law enforcement to recognize uh, the, the the source of money. Okay, let's jump into the second stage. Let's say a layering. Layering is the second step of the three-step process. Layering requires a, a, a the launderer to make numerous transactions, possibly involving several phone companies and entities. By doing this, the owner is attempting to distant himself from the money and make it harder for the uh, authorities to track. Typically, these layers involve foreign countries that have strong bank sectors like offshore, which in turn makes the cash trial harder to follow. It's the advantage of the uh, launderer to use as many layers as possible, using several shell uh, corporations and moving numerous transactions through as many jurisdictions as possible. Other layering techniques involve the purchase of big ticket items such as cars, boots, plants, and securities. These are usually registered in nominee name. We call it nominee. No one is someone other than the launderer, someone else, sometimes friends, family members, um, college students, and I don't know, um, the seniors are paid to be nominees. Casinos are often used to lay a fund because they readily take cash in and the, uh, the facility. Once converted to the cheap, the asset appears to be winnings. And a last stage, uh, we call it integration, the third and final phase of the money laundering process. This is the phase where the layered monies are incorporated in the legitimate financial world and assimilated with the assets of a uh, long time of a legitimate system. In other words, it's spending day for the bad guy. This is the light at the end of tunnel. A giant uh, payday uh, for the launderer. Finally, it's uh, what well, has been waiting for the ability to buy uh, to buy uh, buy cool stuff, uh, or do more uh, bad deeds as a result of proceeds of crime. He will transfer the funds into a mainstream using various methods such as business investment, uh, big ticks, uh, ticket to luxury items, and real estate purchase. No, but uh, I think now it's uh, enough about this. Well, let's watch it in a more interesting way, an illustrative way. Coming up, let's look at it. Let's say you've given up your law-abiding lifestyle to pursue a life of crime. You've just made your first big score, perhaps from selling drugs, taking a bribe, or other corrupt acts. You can't just spend it or deposit it in your bank account without attracting attention from authorities. That pesky money trail might serve as evidence of the crime you committed, so you need to get that dirty money clean. There are three steps to any money laundering scheme. First up, placement where funds are moved from direct association with the crime, then layering, or disguising the money trail to foil any authorities, and finally integration, where the funds are once again available to spend without worry of being caught. So, what are your options? One option is forming a shell company. It's fairly easy, and there are plenty of law firms who can help. It should take them only a bit longer than signing up for a new email address. Launderers may turn to historic tax havens like Switzerland, or places where you can set up anonymous shell companies like the Cayman Islands or the U.S. states of Delaware and Nevada. Once a shell company is set up, make up some fake transactions for goods or services that you pay for with your dirty money. Suddenly, that dirty money looks legitimate. 
It also helps to find people in banking who don't care if you're a shady client. After the fall of the Soviet Union, launderers sought out weak spots throughout Europe where oversight was poor. Billions have been funneled through banks in Cyprus, Malta, and the Baltic nations of Estonia and Latvia. If you prefer to use the stock market, you can try a technique called mirror trading. In this method, you use your money to purchase shares, and then you sell shares worth the same amount somewhere abroad. The trades functionally cancel each other out, but you've successfully turned your rubles into clean euros. A similar method is a back-to-back -back deal, where, say, a Russian takes out a loan in one country, say Austria, that's guaranteed by a deposit of dirty money back home in Russia. She then defaults on the loan, the bank in Austria seizes the Russian deposit, but she still ends up with the proceeds of the loan, no strings attached. Or maybe you like to visit casinos. Another method of money laundering is mixing dirty money in with clean. Cash businesses like restaurants and casinos are particularly attractive to launderers. A common scheme is to buy a bunch of casino chips, make a few small wagers, then cash everything else out as winnings. Or finally, there's smurfing. Though you won't need anything blue to get your green. With this one, you hire a bunch of associates called smurfs to individually deposit small chunks of the large haul you're trying to cleanse in different accounts in different places. Beware. U.S. banks are required to report any transaction over $10,000, so you might need to find a lot of Smurfs. So you can see, there's lots of ways to launder money. Unfortunately for you, there's no guarantee that you won't get caught. Uh, you know that crimes are committed for one of four reasons. The first and probably accountable for 95% of most crime is greed, profit, personal gain. From the drug lord to the low level st uh, street uh, seller, from the master con man to the afternoon burglar, uh, from the corporate embezzler to the credit card skimmer, everybody's aim is money, is gain, something like this. It's almost always about money. It's always been about money. The next reason for crime is passion. There's not much to gain here except revenge, ego or pride. Such crimes are close to impossible to predict and Unfortunately, it does not account for much of percentage of the overall crime picture. The third reason is terrorism. Crimes that have terrorism at the core may be committed for the money, but the money supports a larger cause. In the efforts to support the cause, terrorists will attempt to intimidate and influence the policy of a government or civilians, but the cause needs financial support. Bullets and bombs because money, that's not cheap. The last reason for crime is the un unbalanced mind, it is crazy. Why does a guy walk into a movie, uh, a movie theater or school and start shooting the place? This is much harder to predict and therefore much more difficult to defend. The mass majority of the for-profit for crimes, 95% like I said, of the total number of crimes, remember, remember guys, are committed by some form of organized criminal enterprise. When people hear the term organized crime, they, hey, they have a tendency to sing uh, the Godfather or the Sopranos. Have you seen Godfather? Uh, Marilyn Brando? Or well, many people uh, I say, I don't know, nowadays, there are you know, talk about uh, a uh, theft, uh, theft in law. I don't know, Lotto Bechtiard, uh, talking about this, this kind of stuff. But what many people don't realize is that there are forms of the mafia in almost all ethnic groups, including 
a Russian mob, Italian mob, Irish mob, Jewish mob, Nigerian mob, Chinese mob, and so on and so forth. Now, lots of other forms of organized criminal enterprises. Street gangs, outlaw motorcycle gangs, independent organizations, and terrorist groups, including domestic terrorist groups. Thinking about all that bad guys out there looking to separate you from your money, fortunately, though, there are lots of good people, good person on the front line fighting the battle against these criminals. They range uh, from the military to law enforcement, our regulators to all FIUs, to all good people working you know, in anti money laundering and fraud units in financial institutions. Each one plays an important role in this battle. Last but not least, the question might be why AML efforts on the money laundering efforts are so important? It is a crucial question uh, we should ask. Well, just uh, look at how big an issue is money laundering. It's estimated to be about two trillion, trillion a year industry. Other than crimes of passion and uh, terrorist acts, most crimes are committed for some type of financial profit. Like, like I said, financial crimes affect everyone. Believe me, everyone. Money laundering undermines the legitimate financial sector and can weaken financial institutions. Developing countries especially might be vulnerable because they might not be as selective about their sources of capital and organized crime can misuse these needs. Higher taxes for the rest of us result when criminals do not pay taxes on the activities. Money laundering also creates high operational costs to businesses and those added costs increase the price that we pay at the market for goods and services. Notwithstanding the original predicate offense such as drug dealing or arms trading, the result of money laundering affects everyone. Further, battling money laundering not only reduces financial crime but also diminishes the resources they have to commit other major crimes. Okay, guys, there are probably a lot of untold issues remain, but I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm talking today. A lot of talk. Uh, you're probably bored. You're, uh, I, I might say, admit that you're bored. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, uh, let's watch illustration at the end. While you uh, watch an illustration, I'm going back to my routine. Uh, job, uh, routine work, that's nothing special. I'm going to watch a movie, a uh, TV show. Uh, La Casa del Papel. Uh, between us. <laughs> uh, between us. Um, I was nice to meeting you. I was normal boy with you. See you soon. Thanks.
Que te 